wish you can close your eyes. And if Mel wants to stop. <laughs> so as I mentioned, the first thing in the meditation is to just establish a wise and gentle perception that this is really a gift that you're offering to yourself. A gift of time and space just to be with you, to listen inside to what's going on and to listen with a friendly mind which is open, receptive and warm. So allow yourself to just ease into that space gently without any pressure or rush. You may notice with your eyes closed that your body was sort of seated fairly hastily. There may be things you'd like to adjust. I usually find my ankles and Heels are a little bit close, closely pressed into the thighs. So just giving them a little bit of space, moving them out. And that also seems to straighten up my spine. Checking that your knees are bent not too tightly. Yesterday in the long session, I stretched out one leg. It can be helpful if you have any knee injury. Or you may wish to lean against a wall. Noticing your shoulders whether they're hunching forward or perhaps slightly towards the ears. We tend to keep a lot of tension in our shoulder area. So perhaps just gently roll your shoulders to find out where they are happy to lie. That may also mean adjusting the position of your arms and hands. Adjusting any clothing, maybe irritating or tight. So even this preliminary checking through the body is an act of kindness and care. The opposite of control, pushing your body around, but listening with respect and kindness and allowing the body to give feedback to you. So to begin the meditation, I'd like to suggest if you find it helpful that you imagine that you're surrounded by people you respect. Perhaps the Buddha in front of you, or a great teacher or benefactor. Perhaps as Aya Santachitta beautifully evoked, the image or presence of a bhikkhuni in the time of the Buddha 
one of the great foremothers of old. It can be a real person or imaginary being. For me, I imagine myself with four teachers, one in front, one behind, one either side, and I'm just in the middle receiving their care. Knowing they're not judging, measuring, giving any valuation, but just looking upon me with eyes of kindness and respect, wishing only for my well being, happiness, and true freedom from suffering. If it's hard for you to feel at ease in another being's presence, you may wish to imagine yourself somewhere in nature that you feel very safe, perhaps with a warm sun beating down on your back, or the gentle lapping sound of the waves. And just recollecting that you've learned so much from your teachers, perhaps the ones who are sitting with you now. You understand what meditation is. And now's the time to just put away concepts even instructions or guidance. And just trust a natural process to unfold. Your mind is already inclining to goodness, to freedom, to truth. By the very act of being here. Your only job is to just remain aware with kindness and friendship towards whatever arises in your body or mind. You may find yourself naturally spreading this loving awareness through the body. Or perhaps you find the breath arises in the mind. We may wish just to maintain a very wide and spacious open awareness. receptive and kind to whatever arises in the mind.
almost as though you were absorbing the wisdom, just emanating from these wise beings sitting around you or who you've met in the past. And from time to time, you're reminded to reflect. Is what you experience permanent or impermanent? Can you say it's really yours? Or can you sense that everything arising is just nature arising due to a cause? Nothing good, nothing bad, no need to hold on or to reject. How does it feel to relax, to release any clinging, allowing nature to run its course?
Thoughts arise, they arise due to conditions. Just like clouds passing by in the sky. They don't belong to you. They're not yours to hold or to keep. So just let them come through and pass away. Simply remaining present with kindly loving eyes.
And as we come close to the end of the meditation, staying present for your own experience, you also remember these beautiful benevolent beings surrounding you. And just soak up some more of that wisdom and love. Perhaps imagining yourself gently bidding them farewell with a gesture of respect or simply a quiet smile. And expanding your awareness now to include everyone who's sitting here together. Our spiritual friends on the path, whether for several months or just the last 30 minutes. We're all helping each other incline towards freedom and peace.
just allowing thoughts, feelings, intentions of loving kindness to spread. May we all be happy. May we all be free from suffering. May we learn to release the clinging towards any state of mind. And in doing so, open our hearts to ever increasing peace and joy. Of living a life aligned with the Dhamma. With the truth of impermanence, suffering and non-self. And as that suffering, that clinging is released, our hearts open ever more widely to compassion. So I ring the bell and after the third ringing, you may open your eyes. Very good. So, welcome back. <laughs> Hopefully you didn't disappear too far away. So, as promised, we're going to further the teaching or where we got to last week around non-self. Uh, and not-self, although it's very critical to stream entry, it's also sometimes a little bit more intangible to get a grasp around compared to impermanence and suffering. Uh, it's fairly easy to notice that things change. I remember one of the very first Buddhist similes I heard was of a glass. It was this glass and uh, I don't know if it was Ajahn Chah, he said, is this a glass? And he said, what if it has a crack in it? What if it smashes? Is it then a glass? Is it a glass anymore? And of course it isn't, it's only when things are intact that they actually deserve the designation glass. But the fact that they're impermanent means there was never really a glass there at all. Also, of course, it's easier to observe impermanence within one's own body and mind. I don't know about you, but even just from the beginning to the end of the meditation, there's a big energetic change and also a quietening in the mind. And if you really practice with sort of Vipassana method, you can start to see things arising and passing so quickly, it's really hard to keep up sometimes with the speed of that change. And then with suffering, it's very obvious, isn't it, that we all suffer, at least from time to time. And that not only unpleasant experiences are suffering, sometimes pleasant ones can be a lot of suffering too. Because along with that pleasant sensation or that pleasant emotional experience or maybe sensuality, sensual experience, inevitably there's a sense of wanting to keep it, wanting to make it carry on. And right there, there's a kind of craving and a clinging which is energetically demanding. Yeah? And we get kind of caught up, hooked on these experiences, wanting them again and again. 
I, I mean, for myself, I started noticing in the practice with working with sensations and, you know, very closely observing even pleasant sensations arising and passing, that there was a kind of agitation even in that, even though it felt sometimes like rapture arising quite strongly, it was also slightly agitating, like a, almost an irritation on the peaceful mind. And this is... It's an interesting insight to have because it doesn't actually create more suffering to see that. It just creates this little bit of a sense of letting go and just being able to stand back and allow these things to arise and pass, to unfold according to conditions, according to their natural course. So the Buddha often used impermanence and suffering as a way to describe why things can't be really taken to be a self. And we're going to get into that a little bit more today, just to get a handle on what it really means to talk about non-self. Um, if we want to actually define that in, uh, I suppose, Western conventional terms, sometimes it's said that not-self means a lack of an inherent existence, yeah, or lack of a permanent entity. I think Ajahn Brahm likes to say it's um, the absence of a permanent essence, yeah. Or you could also think of it as that there's no um, being behind experience, behind you know, the experience that's unfolding. There is no kind of being witnessing all of that. The whole thing is just a process of conditions, you know, the effects of conditions are um, manifesting and playing out. So that may sound a little bit challenging or scary sometimes, and I think it's really important um, not to go headlong into these practices or reflections without some kind of grounding in practice or without um, developing quite a bit of kindness. Um, there was a little discussion I had today on Facebook, which is of course where we do a lot of our kind of outreach. And um, somebody had said that, uh, that non-self means there's no separate self. And I made the comment that actually the Buddha didn't use the word separate. He just said there's no self. Because to say there's no separate self implies that there is a cosmic self or there's some kind of self that's bigger than just this particular being. Yeah. But the Buddha actually didn't use the word separate. And then we carried on discussing it and they said, oh, we mean that, you know, it's all um, interdependent. Everything is interdependent. And to some extent, that's true. I mean, of course, causes and conditions external to us influences, you know, our conditionings, our, the way we're brought up, uh, the kind of company that we keep, the teachings that we hear, the books that we read will all influence, you know, the way that this process unfolds. But when the Buddha talked about dependent origination, he wasn't talking about interdependence. He was talking about a process that takes place within one being so to speak, being, the process that happens in our own body and mind. And that's what this dependent origination really means. So as we said last week, it's not that there's nothing there, it's not that there is nothing at all, because we can experience, we can feel, we can perceive. But that what we experience, this thing that's perceiving and experiencing, smelling, tasting, touching, is not actually a self, it's not a permanent essence. So he said somewhere else, I think in the Samyutta Nikaya, that you can't say there's nothing because arising is seen, but you can't say there's something because passing away is seen. But there is a, a truth in the middle of these two, and that is the dependent origination. There's a process of causes and effects, one conditioning the other, and when that effect um, dies down, another cause will come and have its effect. When those uh, conditions are removed, the effects are removed. So in this sense, we can start to understand that there's no actual abiding entity within. We're all in a flux, all in a flow, and we're kind of work in progress, if you will. <laughs> but actually that progress sort of really, hopefully, if we're on the path, leads to ever increasing joy and peace, all the way into cessation, all the way into things ending, because the less we cling, the less there is to hold on to. So the Buddha was concerned with two things, really, suffering and the end of suffering. Yeah. And as I said, like that clinging, that craving, that grasping leads to suffering. And also a release of that clinging, a release of that grasping leads to things settling. The Buddha uses a very nice phrase. He says, the mind becomes cool right there. 
Yeah. And where there's no more grasping, where there's a complete cessation of grasping, there's a complete cessation of suffering. And so the reason that the Buddha taught about the three characteristics of uh, impermanence, suffering and non-self was because by seeing these characteristics, we can loosen that clinging. Uh, if there's really nothing there that we can say is me or mine, then what is there to own? What is there to possess? How can we really hold on? Yeah. It's almost like experience, at least when you experience it, um, when I used to experience in the Vipassana, like this sense of all these sensations just passing away so quickly. It was like sand just slipping through my fingers. And I remember at one time I went to Goenkaji himself because I was sitting on a course with him in like 98, I think it was. And I said, oh, I had this experience where everything dissolves, like the mind, the thoughts, the kind of body, everything just feels like so ethereal and not really solid at all. And I said, along with that came this sense of sadness because I realized that everything that I thought was mine, you know, my family, long way back in England, long way from India, where I was at that time, um, you know, I thought that they were mine and, and they're not, you know, they're, they're also like not really there in a sense, right? And he said basically that this is natural in that stage. You know, it's natural to have these kind of feelings come up because we just have to kind of change the way we perceive. But in the longer run, you know, without sort of dissociating or bypassing this kind of thing or kind of um, intellectualizing it, oh, there's nobody there, so therefore, you know, I shouldn't be attached. This is not the thing. This is a kind of rejection or a kind of dissociation. Instead of that, I actually found it opened me up to more compassion and love. And it also helped me to see that the way people behave in life, the way we play out in a, in a sense, our conditioning, is really not always in our hands, you know? Sometimes people don't really mean to be cruel, they don't really mean to hurt us, but they're just also conditioned by their past, right? Or even just by their mood that day. Something may have happened, somebody may have spoken to them in a nasty way and they're in a bad mood. So it's really not coming from a sense of a person. It's more coming from causes and conditions interacting and it's actually nothing to do with us. There's a very nice phrase, I think it might have been um, Ajahn Sumedho, but also one of my teachers, Shyla Catherine. She's an American, um, very deep practitioner, a lay teacher. She said it really helps to see that there's uh, no self or that things don't belong to a self because then we don't take our life so personally. <laughs> and this is great relief, isn't it? I notice when I'm suffering, it's because I'm taking things really personally, like my whole life, the way it's become, should I have done it this way? Should I have done something different? Was that the right decision? And you take this whole thing personally, not realizing that we don't really have the choice we think we do, right? I mean, in a sense, choice, we think there are some choices and we can maybe see three or four in front of us. But that three or four, those three or four choices might be three or four out of like millions or billions of infinite possibilities. And we're conditioned to only see those three or four. And then we think we can choose out of those three or four. And that's also, yeah, um, debatable. <laughs> um, but hopefully if we have good influences in our lives, then we'll make decisions with a good intention. And Ajahn Brahm always says, once you make that decision, you make it work. Don't sweat too much about the detail. Just make a decision and make sure it works for you. So we can always change and you know, relate to things in, in different skillful ways. So I did promise that we're gonna to go to the suttas and I want to do that um, by starting with a sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. It's Alagad, sorry, I'm hopeless at saying this word. Alagad Upama Sutta, which is Majjhima Nikaya 22. And in here, there's a little section called not yours. So last week we talked about not self from the perspective of, in a sense, not having control over things. But this week we're gonna focus a little bit more on like the fact that they're not ours, we don't own or possess anything. So in this sutta, the Buddha says, um, whatever is not yours, abandon it. And when you've abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. And what is not yours? So you might think, well, my house, maybe my partner, maybe. But here it's getting close to the bone. 
Material form is not yours. Abandon it. When you've abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Feeling is not yours. Abandon it. When you've abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Perception is not yours. Abandon it. When you've abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Here it says formations are not yours. And here this is a translation for the Pali word Sankara, which actually is more like um, volition or will, or you could even say choices, decisions. The part of the mind which is active, which does, which chooses. These are not yours. Abandon them. When you've abandoned them, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. And then comes the really scary bit for some. Consciousness is not yours. Abandon it. When you've abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. So even here, you can see that the reason for this abandoning, and of course, in the context of practitioners who are just, you know, beginning in the practice, Abandoning could mean re loosening, relaxing the grasp upon, um, letting go a little bit, releasing, yeah? Releasing that identification, that sense of um, ownership and control. It will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. And the Buddha says in various suttas, you know, if it wouldn't lead to your welfare and happiness, and if it were not possible to do these things, to cultivate the wholesome states, he wouldn't advise us to do them. So he's only concerned with the end of suffering, with us coming out of suffering and actually experiencing a happiness that lasts. And here a long time means, you know, a long time, <laughs> not just like the next week or the next few months. <laughs> and then he has a lovely simile. He says, bhikkhus, and let's today we'll say bhikkhunis because this session is guided by a bhikkhuni and he was speaking to both. Bikunis, what do you think? If people carried off grass, sticks, branches and leaves in this Jeta grove, that's where he was staying, or burned them or did what they liked with them, would you think people are carrying us off or burning us or doing what they like with us? No, venerable sir. Why not? Because that is neither our self nor what belongs to our self. And then the Buddha says, so too, bhikkhunis, whatever is not yours, abandon it. And when, will, when you've abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. And then he goes through the same little refrain that we had in the beginning. And these five things, the material form, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness, these are what the Buddha calls the five khandhas, which are often translated as aggregates, but I think I prefer Ajahn Brahmali's translation, components of existence. So these are basically what make up our body and mind. Yeah, so he's actually saying, abandon these things because they're not ours. And I just want to again point out that abandoning in this particular stage, I think for most of us in the practice, really means a kind of um, loosening the hold they have on us, like stepping back a little bit, from being over concerned about these things, yeah? Understanding that they arise due to causes and they really are not anything to do with us in that sense, yeah? They're just arising and passing according to their own nature. And really most of the time when we get involved and try to fix up, we basically make things worse. I heard about um, this phenomena that's happening in South Korea related to body, you know, and body image, because body is often where most people are stuck, right? We actually identify with this body and think this body is ours. And apparently in South Korea, because the country is pretty prosperous, um, all these young women are going for plastic surgery, you know, which is common over here as well, I'm sure. But they're all kind of, they've all got the same idea of what beauty is, and they're all basically having the same face made. <laughs> So apparently there are lots and lots of people who've modeled their kind of new face on some kind of, you know, actress or, or pop star. So they've all got this same face, which is very interesting, isn't it? <laughs> so it's like, is that face really theirs? Is our face really ours? I mean, just a kind of gross example. You know, when we see our body and we see our skin, for example, like I see my 
skin on my heels, which is really quite hard and tough and often cracks because I've got all sorts of, I don't know, funny things going on. So the other day I've got this trick. I'm not sure if I should say these things online, but anyway, my trick is for hard skin, and this is really great, you soak your feet in vinegar, right? <laughs> and you don't have to soak them straight away. You put them in a plastic bag. So just pour some vinegar in there with a the plastic bag, tie it up around your ankle, put on a warm sock, and you wait for about half an hour, an hour, and all the skin gets very soft. But then you get a knife, which is a little bit serrated. Disclaimer is that I'm not a medical practitioner. Well, I used to be, but anyway, this is not real advice. <laughs> I'm just telling you a story. So um, get this knife with the serrated edge. And I did this the other day and started scraping and loads and loads of dry skin came off. And, you know, when that skin was on my foot, I guess I thought it was my skin, right? My skin was cracked. But when it was there in the bathtub, it was definitely not my skin anymore. <laughs> it was just kind of debris, right? So at what point is it really ours? And at what point does it belong to nature? Or perhaps it always did, right? It's just that we're warm and we're sort of the blood's running, so we're alive. But that doesn't mean this belongs to us. Imagine people who lose a limb, you know. So a couple of photos recently of a young woman who'd lost a limb. And, you know, she had a whole like lineup of different prosthetic legs for when she goes out dancing or whatever. Each one had a different like stocking. <laughs> Very sweet. And, uh, you know, when that leg is there, we really do claim it and take it as ours. But if we're in an accident, all of a sudden it's severed and gone. So these reflections are fairly basic, you know, um, we can sort of intellectualize it. Sometimes we don't really know it until um, it happens. But I think there are lots of examples in daily life. I mean, another very obvious one is as a bikini or as a nun, you shave your hair. <laughs> and I had lots of hair, I had long hair because I like to swing it around to Led Zeppelin. Ajahn Brahm already talked about that yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but you know when you ordain you take it all off I think by then I'd had a few practice runs I'd already shaved my hair off at about 22 when I did my first month-long retreat and it was beautiful long glossy hair and you know you cut it off and you see it all quite nice and I thought okay what happens if I just like mess it up so I kind of messed it up in my hands and it just looked like a heap of straw and then I don't remember, I might have put it in the Ganges, which is probably not the right thing to do. But it was very sort of symbolic to me, you know, that suddenly there was no hair. And in a funny way, I mean, this is also delusion, of course, but in a funny way, I felt like more real, more myself, because I didn't have that extra decoration. You know, we sort of define our image, don't we, very much by our hair. At least those of you who have some hair, I can see some other, there we go, fellow baldies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway I said I was going to get into the sutta again so I will do that and we'll get into the next paragraph so last week as I said we talked about um, these five candors not being self in the sense that we cannot control them so the Buddha said for example with the body if form were self it would not lead to affliction and it would be possible to have it a form let my form be thus let my form not be thus but because form is non-self, it leads to affliction and it is not possible to have it a form. Let my form be thus. Let my form not be thus. And so he went through all of those, including feeling, perception, volition and consciousness. And then we come to the next part. What do you think? Is form permanent or impermanent? So now we're starting to relate the teachings of impermanence to non-self. And of course, the monks and nuns say, impermanent, venerable sir. Then he says, is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? And they reply, suffering, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change, fit to be regarded thus? This is mine. This I am. This is myself. So I don't know what you all think, is it? Is it fit to be regarded this I am, if it's impermanent and suffering? And one nice sort of uh, way of understanding this, I think, is by translating self as permanent essence, right? Because obviously the idea of a self has to be something reliable, has to be something lasting, otherwise it can't really be said to be 
true, right? So imagine it with that translation. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded? This is mine. This I am. This is a permanent essence. How can it be a permanent essence if it's suffering? And if it's suffering, do you really want it to last permanently? <laughs> that would be terrible, wouldn't it, to be stuck with this permanent essence that was basically suffering. It would be consigning you to permanent misery. So that can't be the case. And as I said, you know, sometimes we think of this body as mine, but we even think of other people's bodies as ours as well. Maybe our children or my, our parents, our partners. Yeah. How many of you talk about my partner rather than Richard or Priska? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we forget that we don't own these things. I'm sure that you all don't do that and, you know, try to possess or own, but look at what happens in cases of domestic violence and why does that happen? Often it's that desire to possess or a delusion that one does possess another being and then that person doesn't live up to their expectations. I think it was Ajahn Brahmali said, expectations are resentments waiting to happen. That's a great one, isn't it? If you have these expectations, it's impossible to fulfill them, either of yourself or of another person. And so we get upset when it doesn't work out. And, you know, we try to control, we try to manipulate, even, you know, actually hurt another person in an attempt to wield control. So, of course, by understanding that these are not ours, it doesn't actually lead to less care. It actually can lead to a greater sense of respect, should lead to a greater sense of respect. So the next one is feeling permanent or impermanent and then the, the monks and nuns say impermanent venerable sir is what is impermanent suffering or happiness suffering venerable sir and is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus this is mine this i am this is myself so how can we say that feeling is ours you know, because we, our feelings change all the time. So if feeling is yours, I mean, which feeling is yours? I suppose all the pleasant feelings are yours, but not the unpleasant ones, right? <laughs> Have you ever heard people say, oh, oh, I was feeling terrible yesterday, but today I feel more like myself. <laughs> I'm sure I've said it too. My mum said it the other day, because actually she had a lot of things that she thought were hers stolen from the house, all her jewellery all her mum's jewellery and my dad's mum's jewellery as well, which is very distressing because she had a lot of memories and, you know, sentiments caught, um, tied up in that. Both um, my mum and my dad's parents died fairly young. Only my mum's dad lived till he was about 90, but I had very little contact with him. So she used to get this jewellery out and show us and tell us stories about where it came from and, you know, what it meant. And so this jewellery disappeared it left the house she couldn't control that she was out so it wasn't really hers so yeah she said to me um that she had a really bad day but soon she hopes she'll feel more like herself <laughs> and i just tried to say that those feelings you know of um, having one's safety a sense of safety shattered it's very, very natural to feel insecure, to feel angry, to feel violated, right? It's very, very natural. So we can't say those feelings belong to us either. If they did, then why would there be things like victim support where people can all talk together about what they went through and basically the advice is similar for all? There are certain patterns of thoughts, emotions, feelings, processes, yeah? Processes that we go through things like trauma. I mean, it's very common in people who have been like serving, you know, in the army, seeing terrible scenes, massacres happen in front of their eyes or even being involved in some of those. There's a certain trauma response that's recognizable and hopefully can be deprogrammed too. So this is all a very positive teaching because these things don't belong to us. And in that sense, we shouldn't take them personally, right? We can't own them. There's no point over identifying because we just get hooked in. 
so that's the feeling and the um, form I don't want to go too much over time I want to give you some time to um, ask questions but the same basically applies to the perceptions and the um, yeah the perceptions is is fairly important but also perhaps easier to understand you know the way we perceive things has been conditioned programmed by our education by you know documentaries that we've seen we see things from a different perspective i was seeing a really fantastic documentary the other day by um uh dear 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 what's her second name i mean you might remember dear khan i totally recommend it dear khan because one of the things that's always disturbed me the most in this world is overt racism. And I know, you know, unfortunately I'm waking up to the fact that we all have racist attitudes. We all have attitudes, you know, from our conditioning, especially white folks in white countries, right? There's this um, privilege that we have that we don't necessarily recognize because it's always been there. Just to be allowed to live in a way where we're not uh, discriminated for the color of our skin. Yeah, sure, we've had unfortunate and difficult situations in our life, but they haven't been made worse by, the skin, by our skin color. And that's what's meant by white privilege, you know, in a nutshell. And um, in this film, it was really beautiful because this lady, I think she's originally um, Muslim from a Muslim country, I forget where, but she lives in Canada. And um, she wanted to talk with white supremacists, like at the front of things like the Ku Klux Klan, um, and find out why and how they were conditioned with these really extreme racist, racist attitudes. And her whole attitude was one of wishing to understand, really wishing to understand and find out, you know, how this happens. So already there's a lot of wisdom in that because she wasn't taking it personally, even though it was incredibly personal in many ways. Um, and also not taking their things personal to them, seeing that there, could, there was a condition and that perhaps they could change. And over the course of interviewing many of these people and talking to them, they opened up, they started to warm to her because of course she's a human being just like anybody else. For many, it was the first time they'd met somebody of color and somebody of the Muslim faith um and but she gained their respect and some of them said you know you respected us and so we respect you and bit by bit people started to change it's a very moving documentary if you want to see it and marie just put it in the chat box so um you can see that maybe sometime it's of course a little confronting to see the fact that there is such hatred and you know violence in the world but it was also heartening to see that many of these people, it was a result of some kind of trauma or ignorance, right? Ignorance having not met people that look superficially different from them. So I actually found it very hopeful and I really respect this lady for just being so incredibly brave and, and compassionate in her approach. So the next one is the Sankara, that Sankara is also not mine. Right, and Sankara, as I said, is like volition or will, choice, choosing. And it's important to mention this because um, Ajahn Brahm calls this one of the two citadels of the self, the places where the self really hangs out and won't let go of identification. So again, you know, the body, the feelings, perceptions even can be seen as pretty malleable, yeah, they change. But this choice, we often identify very strongly with that, our capacity to do, to choose, so much so that we say, you know, we have words like the doer. Yeah, the doing part of the mind is actually more accurate. But he said that this is where the sense of self lies and this can show up in meditation. Yeah, this can show up in the meditation practice in terms of like, I have to do the meditation, I have to get it right. If I put in the right amount of effort, then I'll get the desired result, you know. Um, and one really skillful way that Ajahn Brahm teaches us to let go a little bit of this will is to do it earlier on in the practice. And that's the reason that I like to start my guided meditations with a little bit of um, what Ajahn might call programming mindfulness, kind of establishing a wholesome, positive frame of mind in the beginning. In other words, putting in um, fertile conditions and lifting the mind a little bit, lifting the heart so that it's, you know, ready and receptive 
for the practice and then doing very little doing very little i mean one thing which ajahn bram said to me the other day he said it's a kind of trick is to just kind of scan the body part by part in a very kind and gentle way and just establish a sense of well-being and ease and after that the mind is usually fairly quiet and other kinds of um, experiences can happen like the mind can settle a little bit more onto one object like the breath and can start to really develop deep states of calm which is a very very different way into samadhi practice than just immediately trying to grab the breath and trying to focus and hold on to it yeah it's impossible to hold on to a subtle object with a coarse mind with a gross mind that's not ready and so in a way we're just wasting our time it's because we haven't put the conditions in place it's not because there's any kind of lack of skill or potential in any one of us you know but we just haven't established the right conditions or sufficient conditions to begin so so much of the practice for me nowadays depends on is around putting conditions in place and it's very beautiful because this can extend into daily life you know to the extent that I can really, really emphasize virtue in my daily life, like looking for opportunities to do kind acts. Sometimes I do too much of it, you know, sort of, okay, I'll just share one more video. I'll just do one more thing for the project. And, you know, a lot of it gives me energy and I like to do it. Um, but we also have to balance it with the practice. But even if I do overdo things sometimes in the day, because I can and I have the time, I'm always quite surprised that when I do get time on retreat, there's a sense of, some wholesome qualities that have, have grown and have developed and that then will conduce to the practice unfolding rather naturally mm. even though i've not meditated as much as i used to do um, the foundations are stronger and that meditation happens more effortlessly less of the sense of a doer and so this is how we start to overcome or undercover let's say this sense of self that's wound up with us as the agent the doer the will and so the last one is the fee is the consciousness sorry and this is the one that's really tricky and i know some of you asked me to go into a bit more detail with this so i'll try and do that um and the consciousness is actually related to the six consciousnesses it's the consciousness of i ear nose smell taste yeah? i ear nose smell touch and mind yeah so the five physical senses and the sense of the mind Ajahn Brahm always jokes that we always used to have six senses but we lost our common sense the mind <laughs> apparently in Greek um, I think Aristotle said there were six senses uh, but nowadays in the West we only say there were five but the Buddha considered the mind the vinyana also one of the six senses and that was also subject to the nature of impermanence the characteristic of suffering and impermanence too and there's a very nice um little bit of a sutta that i did want to read if i can find it because this one actually mentions that if anything the mind is even more even less um fit to be called a self than the body so whereabouts is that Okay, here we go. So the Buddha says, this is a Majimin, sorry, Samyutta Nikaya. This is the gray book. It's really great. Uh, chapter 12, Nidana Samyutta. So this is the chapter on causation, dependent origination. So here the Buddha says, Bhikkhus, as to that which is called mind and, mental and mentality and consciousness, so you'll see here that these are synonyms, they're not different. The uninstructed worldling is unable to experience revulsion or disenchantment towards it, unable to become dispassionate towards it and be liberated from it. For what reason? Because for a long time this has been held to be, by him or her, appropriated and grasped thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. Therefore, the uninstructed worldling, that means someone who's not a noble person, who hasn't attained stream entry, is unable to experience revulsion towards it. 
in other words, turn away or become dispassionate towards it, sorry, um, disenchanted, unable to become dispassionate towards it as well, and unable to be liberated from it. And then the Buddha makes quite a strong statement. He says, it would be better because for the uninstructed worldling to take as self this body composed of the four great elements rather than the mind. For what reason? Because this body composed of the four great elements is seen standing for one year, two years, three years, four, five, ten, for 20, 30, 40, 50, or a hundred years or even longer. But that which is called mind and mentality and consciousness, so the Pali words are chitta, uh, mana, mano, and vijnana, arises as one thing and ceases as another by day and by night. Just as a monkey roaming through a forest grab holds of one branch, lets that go and grabs another, then lets that go and grabs still another, so too that which is called chitta, Mano and Vijnana, mind, mentality and consciousness, arises as one thing and ceases as another constantly by day and by night. So even this consciousness is actually impermanent, suffering and also non-self. And uh, yeah, what I wanted to say about that as well is that this is what we often, this is the second citadel of the self that Ajahn Brahm talks about. So the first one is the so-called doer, will, con um, volition. And this one he refers to as the knower. Not because it's a thing or a being, but just because we take it to be the thing that knows. So I'd rather call it the process of knowing because it's actually a process that unfolds. And this is, you know, difficult to get beyond in the practice unless we get into these deep meditations called the jhanas. And um, one of the reasons they're really important is because um, there's this lovely simile uh, called the goldsmith, and I think it's in the Anguttara Nikaya. And the Buddha says that when we practice, it's like purifying gold. He says that there are impurities in that gold, like tin, copper, lead, and a few other different impurities. And to purify the gold, we have to melt it down. We have to melt it, melt it until it's molten. And until we can remove those impurities. And then we have this beautiful gold, which is malleable, which is workable and unbiased. I love this word unbiased. There are several other words there as well, fit for work. So it's like one way of looking at it is that the mind has become purified from the five hindrances and the uh, impurities of gold relate to the five hindrances. But another way that Ajahn Brahm also um, describes is that the mind has been purified of the five senses. So these other impurities were like sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. And when you get into the deep meditation, the really deep proper jhanas, those five senses have turned off temporarily. And so what is left is the goal, the mind. And for the first time, you actually see that mind without the influence of those other senses. So you can get a really good feeling for what it is. And then from that space, you see that from there, because the mind is now unbiased, it doesn't have these five hindrances that distort perception and that make us see only what we want to see and repel us from what we don't want. Because of that, it's actually fit for work. And that means that we have a chance to penetrate into things like impermanence, suffering, and non-self. Yeah. So at first, again, you know, in those deep meditation states, the mind may seem to last for a very long time, almost like one very long mind moment. It's so still. But after emerging from those states, it's possible with that penetrative um, superpower mindfulness and also that stability of mind, it's possible to penetrate into the truth of non-self and to actually see the mind, consciousness or mentality as constantly changing, yeah, constantly arising and passing away. So all of this, although it may sound kind of beyond a lot of our experience, it's still good to hear about it because to me it tastes of freedom. You know, if things are changing so much, if things really don't belong to me, then perhaps I can just loosen my grasp. I can just not take things so personally, not try to own things that are anyway don't belong to me. 
yeah and in the Anattalakana Sutta the Buddha did say I mean there's a bit more to it as well perhaps I'll read that little bit out just so that you get this part too he also said that for any of these five um, components of existence for the body the feeling perception volition or consciousness he actually went even further and just covered every possible manifestation of those five things he said any kind of form feeling perception volition or consciousness whatsoever whether in the past future present internal or external gross or subtle yeah inferior or superior far or near all consciousness should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom thus this is not mine this i am not this is not myself all consciousness gross or subtle inferior or superior so subtle and superior vast exalted cosmic consciousness is also non-self is also not only non-self but suffering impermanent subject to change so we don't want to keep any of that and the whole process towards nibbana towards liberation is to gradually turn away here the word uses revulsion and it does mean revulsion in the sense that it revulses you i, I prefer repulsion repels you away like it turns you away from things which are suffering things which don't have the potential for lasting happiness and toward something else it turns you toward gradual increasing happiness of meditation the gradual deepening peace of samadhi yeah it turns you towards things ending the mind becoming cool it turns you towards things like gratitude inspiration virtue yeah and eventually we become dispassionate to these things i had i read a very lovely translation of dispassion or an explanation of it today by shyla catherine again one of my teachers in america and she said that passion in latin means uh, suffering compassion means with suffering like being present with an open heart in the face of suffering and by the same logic she said dispassion means uh, being present with an open heart without suffering or to things which are not suffering yeah so we unhook ourselves from things like the five khandhas which create suffering and we turn towards nibbana and then he says through this dispassion the mind is liberated when it is liberated there comes the knowledge it is liberated one understands destroyed is birth the holy life has been lived what had to be done has been done there is no more for this state of being so i think this is a wonderful place to leave this and for me i just love those words what what had to be done has been done you know imagine that huh? we've done everything we needed to do the job is finished there's nothing more to be done what a relief <laughs> very good okay so after that talk which i tried to make shorter and probably failed uh, <laughs> we can have a bit longer tonight if people want to stick around because it's the last talk so i'll go on for like another 10 minutes if people want to um, and open up for any questions, comments or complaints. And please